Hello and welcome to this programme. I'm Jerry Clark. And I'm Chris Croft, and this is the first in a series of video stream programmes that the World Happiness Project has created to support the global happiness movement. We're delighted to present this programme that's entitled Happy People, Places, Planet, which was the subject of a three-day conference event that was scheduled to take place at Bournemouth University in April 2020. Yeah, and unfortunately, due to the coronavirus pandemic, the live event had to be postponed. And in its place, we've created this video stream featuring our guest speakers, Sir Anthony Selden, the co-founder of Action for Happiness, uh, Lord Richard Layard, co-author of this year's World Happiness Report, and various other well-known international speakers talking about happiness, mental health and well-being. In this specially recorded program, we hope you will find something useful and inspirational, particularly at this time with the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah. So what are the main causes of happiness? Where do we get our happiness from? And what are the most important actions we can take to secure a happy life? We aim to answer some of those questions over the next 60 minutes. Well, let's get this program off to a happy start. Here's a short introductory video about happy people, places, planet. Now first we've got Sir Anthony Selden, co-founder of Action for Happiness, and he specially recorded this item in the garden of his house. Here it is. And here I am, in the middle of lockdown, in the garden of the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Buckingham, that's my job by the way, and I am going to go through the 10 steps of Action for Happiness, a charity which has been in existence for now nearly 10 years, which I founded together with some colleagues uh, back in 2010. And we came up with an acronym called Great Dream, which symbolises 10 different steps that we can all take to make ourselves happier and each of the letters that make up great dream stand for one thing that we can all do to make our own lives happier. Now how about that? So let's go through them. And G in great stands for giving. Well I hope that I am giving all of you perhaps the most riveting uh, bit of film that you have, perhaps, who knows, ever seen in your lives. And uh, this might not be Hollywood, in fact it's uh, Buckingham, but uh, Buckingham is as exciting as Hollywood. Well, I think anyway. So giving, to give, the more we give, the happier we are, the more we take away, the more miserable we are. R stands for relating. And the better we relate to others, again, the happier we are, the better our friendships with our family, the, conversely, the more that our relationships with others are clouded by bitterness and rivalry and hatreds and suspicion and 
gossip and oh goodness all that stuff uh, the worse we're going to feel and the less happy so I'm now trying to relate to you hello everybody this is me and uh, I hope that I'm relating to you in a way that is recognizable so that's G and that's R and E stands for exercise now as might have been apparent to you I am actually walking around the garden and I'm getting exercise and the more we exercise the better we feel and uh, I try and get exercise uh, to do 12,000 paces each and every day so lots of the time during this lockdown period on the phone to people while I'm walking around the garden or my only one of course I'm very law-abiding one trip outside the house uh, every day so A is for appreciating and here I am appreciating the beauty of nature can you hear the birds and I'm loving it and T is for trying out and the more we appreciate the more we try things out the better we feel so trying out well I'm going to try out sitting here on this bench can you see the bench there under this magnolia tree and oh my goodness that's a fantastic experience I've tried something and I'm really happy now coming down to dream dream D stands for direction well I've got my direction in life most particularly it's walking around this garden at the moment and finishing this talk within five minutes R is for resilience and my goodness I need resilience to keep myself going with the anxiety that I'm going to run out of time and the more resilient we can be the better we feel E is for empathy and the more empathetic we are we can feel and we understand our emotions better again the better we'll feel a is for awareness here i am incredibly aware of everything and m is for meaning and the more we have a meaning in life uh, deep meaningful experiences the more we can say that we truly follow what thoreau said which is that most men and women have lives of quiet desperation and go to their graves with their song still inside them. What is your song? Find your song. Find out about great dream. Live the dream. Now, the next speaker we have is actually me. Um, and I've recorded the talk that I was going to do live at the conference. Um, it's taken from my book, uh, it's actually page 165. And I'm going to talk about stress and the link with happiness, achievement and quality of life. So if the meaning of life is to enjoy and achieve, is there a trade-off between the two? If we have more enjoyment, will that mean less achievement? Or if we have more achievement, will that mean less enjoyment? Or can we do both? And I think we can certainly think of things that contribute to both. So, for example, playing in a band might be enjoyable and give you a sense of achievement. But I think we know that if we go for maximum achievement, that could mean that we might have to sacrifice a bit of enjoyment, a bit of quality of life. I've been thinking about this trade-off between enjoyment and achievement. And I have got a graph here that shows achievement against what I've called quality of life. And I'm going to draw it for you now. And I think this will help you to think about where you want to be in your life. So, what we've got here is we've got one axis, which is the amount that you achieve. And then we've got the horizontal axis here, which I'm going to call quality of life. It's really enjoyment. And the question would be, what shape is this graph as you turn up the wick on the amount you do? So before I draw my big graph, I just want to explain why it is what it is. So if you look in any book on stress, it will tell you that if you have a graph of how much stress from, let's say, from 0 to 10, and then against that you plot the amount that you achieve, you'll find they'll draw a little graph like this with a peak at about 7. So what happens is that as you turn up the wick and you do more and more and you push yourself, 
your achievement goes up until it gets to a peak and then beyond that between seven and ten achievement drops back off again because you're just too stressed out and you're not coping and you're falling apart and that would make you think perhaps that you want to be at seven but do you because would you be happy being at the limit of seven so I think there's a second graph which looks like this which is quality of life against stress again we've got naught to ten on the stressometer and I think the second one would look like this with a peak at about three. So I think maximum quality of life is when you're only at about three out of 10 in terms of the pressure you're putting on yourself. You don't want to be at zero, you'd be completely bored, but you don't want to be higher than three because your quality of life starts to drop off as you're feeling more stressed. So if you combine these two graphs into one, you can get a graph of quality of life against achievement. And I fed this into an Excel spreadsheet ages ago and was quite amazed when this is what came out. If you think about it, this graph actually is correct. So what we've got here is, in terms of the stressometer, if we start at zero, this is us just doing nothing. So, you know, just sitting around, total couch potato. We're not achieving anything. We probably don't enjoy it very much. Then we're moving up here to sort of one and two. And this is like a lazy weekend or something like that, where the quality of life, it's not bad, actually, but we're not really achieving anything. And we're moving up here to number three. So number three is maximum quality of life. This might be where we're on holiday or something like that. And, you know, we're achieving a little bit. We're perhaps exploring the island on a moped or something like that. Or this might be us doing a really easy job. And I mentioned one of my career options was just to do a really easy job and have fun outside. And that would be quality of life maximum, but not achieving very much. Now we go into the trade-off zone. So between three and seven, what's happening is that we are increasing our achievement, but we're reducing our quality of life. So as we go up here, we're trading off achievement versus quality of life until we get to our maximum achievement point up here, where we're at seven. And you can see we've had to sacrifice. We're down to only a medium quality of life now because of having to work long hours. So something like going up the corporate ladder, you'd have to be much more at seven than you would at three. So you're working longer hours. You're doing perhaps some things you don't agree with because your boss wants you to do them and all that sort of thing. And as a self-employed person, I've got to also think about, do I want to be at three or seven? Because when I'm at three, I'm not doing very much work, but I'm on holiday a lot and I'm having fun. But if I turn up the wick to seven, I achieve a lot more, but my quality of life's not so good because I'm spending the whole time driving around the country and staying in hotels in the evenings and working really hard. So I've got this trade-off between three and seven and I've got to decide where I want to be. Now, eight, nine and ten carry on like this. And you can see that now we're at the right hand end of these two original graphs. So by the time we get down to 10, you can see that our achievement has dropped right off because we're so stressed. But also our quality of life is right down to pretty much zero as well because we're so stressed. And we really don't want to be above seven because it starts to be a bad idea. If you're trying to build a company or if you're trying to go up the corporate ladder, if you find yourself going around to eight or nine because there's just so much work to be done, the ridiculous thing is you could be achieving the same amount over here at five or four. You could achieve the same amount and you could have massively more quality of life because here you're just an overstressed, busy fool. You're probably not sleeping, all sorts of problems. And if you're not careful, you can actually spiral down here as well. You can get into a, a loop of not sleeping and you know possibly drinking or whatever else and it can be really bad for you. So we don't want to be beyond seven. And some organizations think that if they push their people up to eight or nine they'll get more out of them but actually they achieve less maximum achievement is at seven so looking at this graph it seems to me obvious that we don't want to be um, beyond seven we might have to go there for a very short blip and work a week or two or perhaps a month really hard but it's not sustainable to be at eight or nine and we also don't want to be below three because if you're down at two then why not turn the wick up and move up here? Because if you go from two to three, you increase your achievement and you increase your quality of life. It's a no brainer to do that. You'd be crazy to be at two. Laziness tempts us to being down at one and two, but actually we're happier if we work a little bit harder and move on up to three. So really the question is, do you want to be a quality of life maximizer at three or do you want to be an achievement maximizer at seven? And I don't think there's a right answer about that. I think it depends on what your personality is like. And you will know from yourself whether you get more satisfaction from achieving or enjoying. But I haven't quite finished. Because I want to say that this is fairly flat across the top here. So if you are an achievement maximizer, it might make more sense to be at six rather than at seven. 
because you could see the difference between six and seven. There's a big, significant increase in the quality of life um, for only a tiny sacrifice in achievement. So if you want to be the world champion or something, you probably have to go to seven. But for most of us, to go to six would be very nearly as much achievement and a much better quality of life. So is it worth giving up all of that in order to get a slight bit more of achievement? And quite often that last bit of achievement is just ego. So just let that go and have a more enjoyable quality of life. And similarly over here, it's pretty flat. So if you're a quality of life maximizer, why not go from three to four and just pay a small price on your quality of life to achieve quite a bit more. And that would seem to be a more sensible place. I would argue that four is more sensible than three. And similarly, six is more sensible than seven. So I think the acceptable range really is between four and six. And the question is, where do you want to be between four and six? I can't answer that for you, but I hope this is a, a useful model for you and it helps you to think about where you are at the moment in your life. Are you being a bit crazy? Are you at eight or nine, which is definitely not sensible? Are you being too lazy down here at one or two, which is also not sensible? Or are you at three or seven? And would it be worth moving from three to four? Or would it be worth moving back from seven to six, perhaps? And then for your future career, for all the years to come, are you going to aim to be a six type person? Or are you going to aim to be a four type person? Or are you going to swing between them? You know, maybe you're going to work really hard at seven for a while and then you're going to go for your early retirement and get to three or something like that. I've been at six or seven quite a while now and I'm trying to cut back and go more to three or four as I get a bit older. I'm thinking rather than retire suddenly, I'm going to just gradually do this. So I've been pushing back recently and doing a bit less and a bit less and I'm trying to move it round to four. That's my plan. Now you may say I've got no control of where I am on this, but I actually think you do have quite a bit of control because within a job, you've got a choice about how ambitious you want to be, how hard you want to work. You've also got a choice over jobs you choose in the future, whether you want to choose a job that you know is going to be at seven or eight, or whether you want to choose a relatively easier job that's at five or six, more within your comfort zone. And then whether you're doing a side hustle or extra things in your spare time, even just how busy you are in your spare time also affects where you are on the stressometer. So I think you do have a choice over where you want to be on this graph. And I can't tell you where you particularly want to be, but I think it's really interesting to think about yourself. Certainly, I always have this graph in my mind when I'm thinking about where do I want to be? Where am I trying to push my life next? So I find this really helpful and I hope that you will too. Next we have Julia Seibold. She's going to talk about the Action for Happiness course, which is known as Exploring What Matters, how she discovered it and what it's like to run the course. When I heard of Action for Happiness and their course, Exploring What Matters, it was a perfect fit. This course, designed by Action for Happiness, the patron being the Dalai Lama, is so brilliant because it is an eight-week course run by volunteers who meet with the community um, and then go through these two hours and answer and tackle big questions. And it's not that everyone knows the answer. It's more about an inward journey and looking at experts and tuning in to what sits right with you. So it's more a philosoph philosophical um, approach based on science and data. And so this course book is given to every participant. And together we go through, look, it's a tuning in, we look at an interview, um, an expert view, then we have discussions and include the personal view, our personal experiences, and everyone is able to share that with the group. Um, also a group discussion, and then what Action for Happiness stands for, action ideas because we know that only in turning things around for long term we do want to bring it into action that's when it counts and that's when it makes sense in our own life and in the life of others and all we're doing here through these weeks um, are questions like what really matters in life what actually makes us happy how can we find peace of mind how should we treat others can we build happier communities and so on? 
It's such valuable questions and I'm so glad and actually not surprised that the Oxford University and a London School of Economics has done controlled trials to actually find out that this course is by evident evidence bringing happiness levels up. The rise of happiness is evident through this course. Isn't this brilliant? And I agree. And why is this not a surprise to me? Because I know from all the studying and science I've been reading that where we put our energy, that grows. Where we put our focus, that grows. So if we put our focus in this kind of way, like a f sound foundation with the possibility to include our own viewpoint and listen non-judgmental to others, then that is a focus for eight weeks, which surely rises our happiness levels in long-term effects with taking action. I'm so pleased to be part of this and it's run in 18 countries. So whoever is wanting to be part of this movement, join the movement. And this course is such a wonderful facilitation. Go for it. Next we have Dulcie Bat who's going to tell us about Dorset's first happy cafe. Hi there, my name is Dulcie Bat, and the wonderful Jerry Clark and Chris Croft have asked me to record a short video for you with regard to Dorset's first happy cafe. So as a collaboration, we set up Dorset's first happy cafe at the plantation, which is now currently the Canford in Poole. Um, and the reason we did so was off the back of a successful eight week course that myself and Julia Seibold ran. It's the Action for Happiness Exploring What Matters course, um, which we ran in January to March last year. It was a resounding success and we decided that there was a need for more work to bring our community together and inspire like-minded souls. So inspired by Action for Happiness, um, having already set up the first Happy Cafe in Brighton, we decided to take um, the bit between our teeth and set up the Dorset Happy Cafe. So what's the concept? It's very simple. It's is that people can come together and meet and be inspired each month for a period of two hours over a coffee. It's very relaxed. There will always be somebody delivering a talk that's appropriate to the theme of the month. Julia and myself will host the morning and there is always huge opportunity for discussion amongst the group. So the way they run is that at the beginning we introduce the theme and it may be along the lines of how Action for Happiness guide us. So each month they will give us a pointer. So there's Happy January, for example, Friendly February, Mindful March, Active April. Uh, so Active April is clearly what we're currently in, although this month, given the lockdown, it has been reframed as Active Coping April to help people um, cope actively with the current situation. So we take the topic and we will introduce it and then everybody will go around the room and introduce themselves. And this is one of my favourite parts of a Happy Cafe Meet because um, with their introduction, people will give a reason that made them super happy since we saw them last, so in the, in the past month. And always these insights are so inspiring and there are many me too moments where you'd actually forgotten that that walk on the beach or that bit of gardening you did or when a dear friend called had lifted you so much and when you hear other people share their inspiring stories it really does give you a lift so that's always great um, then we will do a short meditation 
which is always an integral part of the, the session. It is so that people can arrive mind, body and soul and really leave all their worries at the door and connect completely to the meeting and to the people around them. Then we will have um, an open discussion with regard to one of the topics. And the topics are always focused on Action for Happiness's um, 10 keys to happier living which are clearly labelled on their website. Um, it's covering things like giving and relating and exercising. For example, Active April typically is about exercising. It's about direction, resilience, um, emotions, acceptance and meaning. Um, just this idea that we are part of something bigger than our immediate um, community. And I think that's one of the really beautiful things about the Happy Cafe is it does connect you so wonderfully with community around you and it's open to all. It's all ages, it's all levels of experience and there is such a wealth of experience and expertise always in the room. So in the sharing um, element, it is really wonderful to hear people bring their voices to the room and much less a case of Julia and I and whoever the speaker may be um, teaching before the group, but very much us teaching amongst. Um, so there are always lots of fun, there are lots of giggles, uh, we have music, we do um, specific themes around Christmas, um, so there were carols and hats and um, all sorts of silly goings on. Um, you are so welcome to join us. They really are enriching. Um, one of the greatest uh, things about it is that you leave the meeting feeling uplifted, inspired and motivated to do something about it. So in line with Action for Happiness, there is always action that we urge people to take. Now, one of the act actions people can take is by printing out one of these calendars. Um, we always have uh, several copies available on the day. So these calendars are created by Action for Happiness and every day gives you an inspired idea for some action you can take to embody and enact the theme of the month. So for example, um, where are we today? the 14th of April, play a game that you enjoyed when you were younger. What a great way to connect with something that made you super happy when you were younger and I bet that it will make you happy now. So many top tips shared, always a welcoming event, always action taken as a result of the meeting and people commit to that action and then come back the following month and share their experiences you would be warmly welcome. Currently the meetings are all via Zoom online as we take all our gatherings online during the current lockdown. But we're hoping that we can resume our usual physical meets, which will be on Monday, the first Monday of the month at the Canford in Pool. And if you um, would like any more information about it, please either contact myself, Dulcie Bat, or um, Julia Seibold, or Jerry Clark, or just look on Facebook or Instagram for Paul Happy Cafe. We look forward to welcoming you soon. It's goodbye from me for now. Many thanks. Now we have a talk from positive psychologist Leslie Lyle on surviving in adversity. Originally, I was going to give a talk which was going to be called Thriving, Not Just Surviving in Adversity. And it was largely based on my own experience of a challenging health situation where I use positive psychology interventions from the science of positive psychology to help me cope. But I could never have anticipated how life would change in just a few weeks. And suddenly that journey that I took, that diagnosis, the surgery and treatment for bowel cancer has almost faded into insignificance in comparison to what's happening around the world today. Things that are affecting every single one of us in one way or another. So now my message would be 
more on actually surviving, finding ways to cope uh, with the multitude of challenges that we're all going to potentially face every day. And I would advocate taking one day at a time, practice mindfulness and doing the very best we can with the resources that, that we have. So not in any way wishing to minimalise the terrible consequences of this virus and the devastating effects it will have for numerous families around the world. I have been so uplifted by the positive responses from the general public. Now, you're probably aware that a lot of research shows that gratitude is the most common ha habit and behaviour of people who are happy, healthy and successful. And there's lots of positive psychology interventions like gratitude diary writing or uh, writing a gratitude letter, which have been shown to increase well-being. And now it's being expressed in so many different ways by so many different people. It's heartening. We're so grateful and appreciative of people like the NHS staff, uh, shop assistants, refuse collectors, cleaners, delivery drivers, volunteers and other service providers. And we demonstrate our appreciation in a number of ways. For instance, on a Thursday, millions of people around the UK are shouting, cheering and applauding to show their appreciation. And there are messages and videos online, there's posters in windows, so many creative ways to say thank you. And what strikes me is that these people who we're so grateful to have almost been invisible to us for a lot of the time, completely outside our conscious awareness. And suddenly it's apparent how important these people are, how reliant we are, and how much worse this situation would be without them. May we never take them for granted again. And the news, although of course it's showing very upsetting statistics about the number of people who've been struck down by this COVID-19 virus, are also showing how communities are pulling together. The creativity that the ideas are coming up with while still maintaining social distance. People literally dancing in the street. And people who've lived for years in the same street without really knowing their neighbours are now connecting and supporting each other. People around the world are singing, they're playing instruments and they're coming together, united. Now, modern technology means that we can stay in touch with our families online, but of course it's not the same. Museums and art galleries and zoos are giving free virtual tours to relieve boredom for people. And other people are giving away their online material from their courses. People are getting education and entertainment. And for many of us, it's been a time for deep reflection, an opportunity to really reassess our values and consider what really matters. People and experiences outweighing any pleasures from things. And the simple things in life that we miss most seem to be those that previously, previously we've just taken for granted. And when this is over, and it will eventually be over, we should ask ourselves the question, what sort of back to normal do we want? What do we want normal to be in the future? How might our values have changed? Maybe we'll place more value on family, community, having more time, more freedom, being out in nature, and then prioritising the importance of cooperation, friendship, love, compassion and kindness more than ever before. We may be less motivated to chase material wealth and driving ambition. And my hope is that we realise and recognise that every single one of us, every single one of us matters. 
and that we remember or perhaps discover for the first time the relevance of the nine line prose by John Donne in which he explains why no man is an island. Next we have Mike Viking from the Danish Research Institute and he's giving a talk called Searching the World for Happiness. This is extracted from the World Government Summit recording from 2018. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Mike Viking and I am from the Happiness Research Institute in Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. And we are basically trying to solve three questions. First, how do we measure happiness? Secondly, why are some people happier than others? And thirdly, how do we improve quality of life? It's also why I'm going slowly gray in my mid thirties, uh, or as I like to call the color executive blonde. Um, we're also a, a think tank, and a think tank is essentially a bridge between the academic community and the public. So we are trying to take the great scientific findings and bring them to a wider audience. And it's also what I would like to address here today, how we take the scientific findings uh, that we have been uh, presented, for example, here today, and convey them to a global audience. Also, how we engage more people in uh, the happiness agenda, turn them into change makers and turn them into active stakeholders. First, though, I would like to, to add a bit more on the uh, Scandinavian happiness puzzle. I would like to talk a little bit about my home country and my hometown, Copenhagen, because as Alexander Stopp formerly mentioned uh, or mentioned before, it's not only that it is extremely cold in Scandinavia, I'm also often confronted with the question, you are paying some of the highest taxes in the world, how come are you still so happy? Especially from American journalists, actually. Um, I like to turn it around and say maybe we are happy because we are paying high taxes. So I pay 50% of my personal income in tax. But I, together with nine out of 10 Danes, are happily paying our taxes. And we do that because we feel we get a lot in return. We don't see them as taxes, we see them as private investments in the public good. We see them as investments in quality of life. Investments in education, investments in social security, investment in equal opportunities, men and women, rich and poor. I think the key to understanding why the Nordic countries do well is that they are relatively good at creating good conditions for good lives. They lift up the bottom, that improves the average, and that's why we come out on top. So you can say we're the happiest countries in the world, or you can say we're the least unhappy. And just to give you a few examples from my own life, I think what works well in Denmark and the rest of Scandinavia is that those countries remove the price tag there is on happiness. And what I mean by that is whether you are rich or poor, you will still be able to enjoy a relatively high level of quality of life. In Copenhagen, on my every day, I cycle to work. I don't own a car because I don't need a car. The majority of people in Copenhagen do like me. We cycle to work, we cycle to university, even the majority of, of the members of parliament cycle to parliament. We don't do it because it's something that keeps us, us healthy. We don't do it because it's good for the planet. We do it because it's fast and it's convenient. Because there's been a lot of investment in infrastructure for cyclists, for pedestrians. So as a pedestrian or as a cyclist, you are not treated as a second-rate citizen, but you are the king and queen of the road. It also means that even if I lost my job tomorrow and all my income, my mobility is not lost. My mobility is not based on whether I make a lot of money or few money. 
So that is something that reduces worry, is something that reduces stress and anxiousness. Another example is, you see the picture on the right there. That's from the Central Harbor in Copenhagen. I go there in the summertime to take a swim. And in all honesty, our summer lasts about an afternoon, then it's back to, to winter again. But this, this afternoon is really lovely. And it's something that I can enjoy and the rest of Copenhagen can enjoy because there's been a lot of investment in cleaning up the harbor. And it's also something that is accessible for all, whether you are rich or whether you're poor. So we invest in quality of life. The question is then, how do we bring all these findings to a wider audience? And I'll base my points here on the, the experience I've had with my, my former, uh, or my two latest books, which have uh, been embraced by, by a quite wide audience. And basically what I've done is I've taken the scientific findings. For example, in my latest book, I've used the six factors that is presented in the World Happiness Report, as some of you are familiar with, the six factors that explain why some countries are happier than others. We all know them well. What I've tried to do is I've tried to find people that embody those six factors. Because one thing is the data, which shapes the science, and we've been shown a lot of diagrams here today and a lot of numbers, but the stories spreads the science. And I think that's what we all need to remember more. Find narratives, find people, find people who embody the points we're trying to make, because those are the points that people will remember. So I'll just give you two examples of people who embody some of the six factors. So the first, I'm sorry, Gabriele, is not from South Australia, but is from Western Australia. So here on, on the right, we have a woman called Shani. And what Shani has done is she has taken a street and she has turned it into a community. There's been a lot of talk about social uh, connection here today. And now, what used to be an ordinary town, ordinary neighborhood, ordinary street, is a street where they have movie nights, they have pizza nights, there's a pizza oven in the back there, I'm not sure what this is, but it looks like fun. Uh, they also have community gardens, and they even have a goat that grasses across, across several lawns. I would have loved to grown up on a street with goats. But what Shani did was she started to connect with her neighbors. She wanted to create a street directory so she started, she started to knock on people's doors and got contact information, names, and so on. But she also asked people, what kind of street would you like to live on? And what do you have and what can you give? And people, there was a young boy who said, I'd love to babysit uh, cats and dogs for my neighbors. And there was another guy who said, I need people to help me eat mulberries because in the mulberry season, I have too many. But there was also, she noticed, three ladies on the street who enjoyed singing. And there was an ex-choir mistress, so they formed the Holbert Street Choir. And that became the first step on a journey. I think Shani is a great example of how we can create more connection and turn neighbors into friends. And I think Shani is a great way for us to remember that point. Another story, and a very inspirational person I met also on my travel is this guy. His identity is a secret, and he's the closest thing to a superhero you can get. So I call him Clark. Uh, in the UK, he's known as the free help guy. He helps people for free. So he has tried to reconnect a father with his son. He has tried to help a young girl suffering from cancer, find a uh, bone marrow uh, donor. And he has tried to help a guy get over his fear of flying by sitting next to him on a plane. This all started a, a few years ago when Clark uh, was in his mid-twenties and he was working in marketing in central London, every day commuting to Oxford uh, Street uh, Circus and just feeling 
a little bit fed up, a little bit disillusioned. And then he decided that he wanted to give himself six months to find a way to earn his worth in more than pounds and pennies. In the first week, he binged watched uh, Breaking Bad. Uh, but then, for some reason, he decided to write in or on an online forum, is there anybody I can help? I'll do it for free, the free help guy. And the first people to respond was a couple, I think they were called uh, Jill and Richard. And they had uh, provided a room, they had a spare room in their house, and they had borrowed that to a homeless person. But now that homeless person had secured a job and moved on. So they needed somebody else to help. And that became the first uh, step in a long journey. Now he wants to make this project permanent. Because despite the fact that he has helped many, many people, he feels that the one that have benefited the most from this project is himself. I remember he said, my heart beats in a way that it never has before. I think Shani and Clark are great examples of togetherness and the value of kindness and generosity and helping others, and, and by that, achieving happiness for yourself. So my third point was, how can we also get people more involved in the happiness agenda and turn them into active stakeholders? And I'll tell you what, what we've done, what I've done with the books, is that I've asked people to become my eyes and ears. I've asked people to spot and tell us about what works in their world in terms of what improves quality of life, in terms of what improves happiness. And then hashtag it with look for Luke on social media. And also become champions of change and heroes of happiness. And this week I saw we now have almost 700 people showing us what they have done and what they've seen other people do in terms of improving quality of life. So we see people helping each other. This Janet on the right, she made a bean soup after her grandmother's recipe and gave it to a person in need. So we see people reconnect with nature. I think the left one is from Iceland and the right one is from Russia. We see people biking. As a Dane, that makes me very happy, uh, both in, in Russia and, and uh, mid-November, I think, going to work. Um, we see people trying new initiatives in schools. In the book, we talk about the brain brushing exercise from Bhutanese schools, a mindfulness exercise they start and finish their day with. A school tried that. That's on the left. On the right is a game or a modification of a game I suggested in the book. How many know musical chairs, right? We play music, there's not enough chairs for everybody. When the music stops, we sit down. Those that did not get a chair, get out, right? That's a game that teaches the kids to compete over scarce resources. So we turned it around and turned the competition into a corporation game. We play the same element, we still play music, there's still less chairs than people, but instead of throwing people out of the game, we tell them, well, now you have to sit two people on a chair, or three people on a chair. So this one on the right, there are now, what, six or seven people on a chair. So we teach them to cooperate instead of to compete. We also see people exploring community libraries, mini libraries, and even creating community gardens as they did in Western Australia. And I'll leave you with this, because I think what we did was essentially a very simple thing we showed people some visions of what their neighborhoods and their countries and their societies and their cities could look like. And I think dreams are a very powerful motivator in terms of getting people out and getting people active. And I think what we essentially did was we tapped into the point that is best said by the author of The Little Prince, who wrote, if you want people to build a ship, don't drum them up and assign them tasks and work but instead get them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. And I think that's also what we need to do. We need to get people to start dreaming about what their streets, their cities, and their societies could look like. Thank you.
Now we have a talk specially recorded for this programme from our good friends Susie and James Powalski, authors of the book Happy Together. Hi, I'm Susie Pileggi Powalski. And I'm James Powalski. We're so happy to be here today to talk to you from Philadelphia, the United States. We wish that we could be with you in person today, but uh, we are experiencing some unusual things in our world. And so we're unable to gather together physically. In fact, we're sure that you, like we, are practicing what they're calling social, social distancing. distancing. I, li I understand the importance of it, but I don't much like that term. What about you, Susie? No, I don't love social distancing, but we all need to do it for our health and for everybody's health around the world. The important thing to remember is, just because we're social distancing doesn't mean we should be isolating emotionally. So I'm fortunate to be with my partner and with our son who's playing somewhere in the background. Uh, many of you may be home by yourself. And if you are, all the more reason to reach out and connect with others. We evolved as social animals and we need one another. Our social connections have been found to be the most important thing for living a flourishing life. So whether we're talking about your significant other or a close friend, family member, maybe a work colleague, even if you're not seeing them right now and you happen to be you know, secluded, uh, that isn't a reason to be shut down. You wanna reach out and connect with them and um, just show your uh, love and concern for others because we all could really use support right now. So social distancing really is a trigger for uh, reminding us that we need relational connection. So what are some ways, Susie, that people can practice relational connection these days? Well, I think one thing is just to slow down and savor the moment. So instead of just waiting for those grandiose occasions, maybe a big anniversary or you know a wedding or a party or a promotion, they're all wonderful things and definitely should be celebrated. But what about those small little things that happen all the time? Whether it's your spouse cleaning up the dishes, taking the trash out, or just you know replacing your favorite coffee when you're running low, just saying thank you and really acknowledging uh, his or her actions and taking in a moment and realizing they did something good for you. I think we let a lot of those things pass way, way too many times in life. Yeah, and I think especially these days, it's so important to focus our attention and to be mindful of what we're attending to. There is so much news, uh, so much really disturbing news, um, so many really disturbing news headlines, and it's easy to be so caught up in the difficulties that those are presenting that we can forget that there are a lot of other things that are going well in our lives and in the world. There are silver linings to the experiences that we're having. There are still fundamental underlying positive elements in our lives and in our relationships. And if all we focus on is the challenge, the problems, which are real, not to minimize those, but to make sure that we're, we have a balanced approach to focusing on also what is going well, it's important because for, for several reasons, one, to maintain our mental health, but then also to maintain the kinds of positive emotions and creativity that's necessary for taking helpful, positive action, even in the midst of difficulties and crises. Definitely, definitely. And expressing our gratitude for one another and really taking the time to reach deep inside of ourselves and use our inherent strengths. We all have strengths and we have them in different configurations. Some of us maybe lead with creativity and leadership and others might be leading more with kindness. We hope everybody's kind and social intelligence, but whatever those qualities you have that are just your natural qualities, really leading with them and trying to help yourself and your loved ones during this difficult time. Absolutely, and this is a, a, an opportunity to find new ways of putting those strengths into practice. We're, we're living in times that are unsettled, and that 
unsettles old routines, which certainly uh, can be difficult and can also open up new possibilities. So by focusing on our strengths and considering how we can use them in new ways, that might help us to be able to identify those silver linings more powerfully and to support each other and our relationships during this time. And don't give up. Happiness, like anything in life, really takes effort. You have to work at it. There's habits. So even if you're feeling pretty down right now, like many of us I know are, lots of uncertainty in the world, what are those small things you can do every day for yourself and for the people you care about to make a positive difference and add uh, some brightness uh, to the day? Well, thank you so much for allowing us to be with you in this virtual way. We wish that we could be with you physically and we hope that uh, at some point we will be able to. And we look forward to hearing your stories at that time of what you have done in these challenging days to um, strengthen your relationships. Thank you. Thank you, be well. Next, we have a talk from Professor Sonia Lubomirsky, and her talk is called The How of Happiness, the same name as her excellent book on happiness. And this is taken from a conference that she spoke at in 2016. And so there's lots of strategies that people can use to become happier. You all, you all know about many of them, uh, probably hundreds. And so these are just some examples that have been supported by research that happier people are more op optimistic, they're more likely to meditate, they're more likely to exercise, they're more likely to be forgiving. Um, and so what I do in my work is I try to test these strategies, not all of them, but some of them, in a systematic, scientific way. And so what we do, we call positive interventions, and an intervention is basically an experiment in which people are instructed to change themselves to sort of result in a positive change. So positive interventions are kind of like clinical trials. They're not technically clinical trials, but they're similar in that if, when you do a clinical trial, you might be testing, like, is a particular drug effective? And you might, test, you might ask questions like, well, what is the appropriate dosage of the drug? And should some people not take the drug? And should it not be combined with other drugs? And so that's the kind of thing we ask in our research. So what is the proper dosage for gratitude? And should gratitude not be done by certain people? Um, and I'll tell you about some of those studies in a minute. Okay, so uh, different kinds of happiness interventions we've conducted, uh, usually uh, over the course of uh, four to 12 weeks, we ask people to try a new happiness strategy and we follow them across time. So we've asked people to count their blessings, to affirm their most important values, to savor and replay their happy days. Um, we, I was on the, um, uh, the Today Show in the United States uh, talking about the um, live your life like it's their last month one, this one. Um, and that was, that's a really cool one. We did a study where we asked people, okay, imagine that a month from now you're moving away. You're moving somewhere far away. You're not sure when you're coming back. And so live your life like it's your last month, you know, at your current sort of city location. And we found that people really did live their lives differently. They, they were more likely to, to, to see their friends and family. Um, they took their favorite hikes. They went to their favorite restaurants. We also uh, discovered that there was an increase in one night stands among the <laughs> subjects. So um, we didn't expect that necessarily. Um, <laughs> These were young, young college students. Um, so anyway, so we've done lots of studies like this. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the, some of the, I'm going to tell you very, very briefly about some of the studies at my workshop tomorrow. I'm going to go through some of the same material and of course more material in a lot more detail, a lot slower. Um, and so I'm a basic scientist, so the question that I ask in my research is basically how and why do these happiness strategies work? Um, and sort of what, are the, what is the secret to their success? What are the factors that underlie their effectiveness? And so for example, and by the way, some of you or many of you might know some of these studies, but again, I'll sort of review them. So we did the very first positive intervention that we've ever done is we asked people to count their blessings uh, for a period of six weeks, so every week. Uh, we ask people to write down what they're grateful for, up to five things that they're grateful for, um, except we varied how often they did it. So here we were interested in the role of dosage, right? So we varied whether people counted their blessings once a week or three times a week. And so, um, and so um, these are histograms showing increases or decreases in 
gratitude and happiness from before to after the six-week intervention. And so you see that when you look at changes in gratitude, if you count your blessing once a week, you become more grateful over time. Um, and if you, um, and also if you count your blessings once a week, you become happier over time relative to the control group. Um, if you do it three times a week, nothing happens, no change. Um, and so we were very interested in that finding. Um, maybe, maybe counting your blessings three times a week is too much. It becomes kind of a, a burden or a chore, or maybe it backfires because you, you, it's hard for you to think of things to be grateful for when you do it too often. And so you might conclude, gee, maybe there's nothing I'm grateful for. We actually are testing that in a study that we're running right now. Um, but anyway, so that, that, that's, a, that's a study that highlights the importance of dosage. So I'm gonna show you sort of this, this, this slide repeatedly, kind of what, are, what factors are important in implementing positive activities in the most optimal ways. And so the first one is dosage, sort of how often, how much do you practice it? Um, now, when I talk about kind of counting your blessings, some people t uh, come up to me and they say, oh, um, you know, I don't know, I, I would never be caught you know, with a gratitude journal in my hand. I, I think counting blessings is trivial and kind of hokey and trite. And some people tell me, well, I count my blessings every morning and that really works for me. And so that seems to counter the results of my, the study that I just showed. But it doesn't really, because my research also shows that what's really important about practicing happiness activities or strategies is fit, is that you have to find the activity that fits your personality, that fits your goals, that fits your strengths, or fits the source of your unhappiness if you, if you are unhappy. Um, and so, for example, I have a colleague who would never, ever keep a gratitude journal, but he discovered that writing emails to some important people in his life, like former mentors, parents, uh, was very meaningful. And so there's sort of different ways of expressing gratitude. You can write, you can share it with others, you can use an app, you know, you can use a website. Um, so there's different, you just have to sort of find the right way to practice your strategy. So fit is really important. We've also looked at the importance of social support. And so I'm a runner and um, in the morning I have a buddy that I run with. Um, and so I set out my clothes before I go to bed and I wake up and it's really, really early, the alarm goes off, and I don't want to get out of bed, but I know that she's going to be waiting for me on a street corner in Santa Monica, and she's going to be really upset if I'm not there, because I'm sure she's feeling the same way about waking up. And so having that buddy really, really helps maintain my uh, exercise routine. And same thing with happiness, right? So having a buddy or your family member supporting you is important. So in this study, um, we asked people over the course of four weeks to do that best possible self-intervention. So every week you write about your best possible self in different domains of your life. And the control group actually got less happy over time. Uh, if you have no social support, but you just do this optimist intervention, you get happier. But if you have social support, again, if you have family members, friends that are supporting you, encouraging you, helping you uh, sort of get, get through obstacles, then you become even happier, right? So that's the importance, uh, that shows the importance of social support for the pursuit of happiness. One of the basic kind of take-home messages from my research, which is that happiness takes work, just like anything in life, your marriage, your career, uh, raising kids, um, becoming fit or losing weight, they all take work, um, including the pursuit of happiness. So where are we going now with our research? What's next? Uh, we've run about two dozen happiness interventions. We're running about half a dozen as we speak. Um, still trying to ask the question, how do positive activities work? Um, so some relevant questions we ask are, um, does age matter? So we've done studies with kids, and it looks like age does not matter much. Um, kids seem to benefit just as much as adults. We did, we did a study with teenagers, with 800 teenagers in the United Kingdom, and we were worried about the teenagers because we thought, wow, teenagers are the most ungrateful people in the world, right? <laughs> They're, are they going to enjoy, you know, writing gratitude letters, but actually they did. It's like they recognized that they were ungrateful and they wanted to become more grateful. Older people, you may know, are actually happier than younger people uh, by on average. Um, older people are emotionally wiser. It's like they know what makes them happy and they do that. They spend time with people who make them happy. Younger people are more likely to take risks, which is important. That's part of you know, what you're supposed to be doing when you're young, taking risks and exploring your identity, exploring, you know, your, your interests and values. Um, so older people are a little uh, happier than younger people. So I'm going to end by, uh, I guess, reiterating 
that I think happiness is really important. It's not just about feeling good. Happier people are better leaders, they have better relationships, they're healthier, uh, they're more creative, they make more money. Um, but it's not easy to become happier. T happiness takes work. Uh, you, if you want to be happy, if you want to help other people become happy, you have to kind of begin today, act now, uh, put the effort into it. Um, I always like to end with a quote from Aristotle, you know, one of my heroes uh, from 2,000 years ago who kind of summarized the gist of my research, which is that happiness depends upon ourselves. Thank you. Finally, we have a brief talk from Lord Richard Layard, co-editor of the World Happiness Report. And this is taken from the launch of the report in March 2020, which was done via a, a live video webinar. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we are in a very difficult situation, but I do believe that if we handle it right, uh, we can come out of this better than we went into it. We can come out of it with a society in which people are caring more for each other uh, and in which they are taking better care of themselves. So let me start with the care for others. Obviously, uh, as Jeff has said, we're going to have millions of people self-isolated, not just to protect themselves, but to protect others. We're going to have lots of healthy people looking after frail and lonely people, uh, either uh, directly or remotely. Uh, we're going to have millions of people looking after other people's children who are not in school. And of course, we're going to have millions of uh, healthcare workers uh, risking their lives on our behalf. Now, all of these kinds of actions went on every day in the Second World War. There was an unprecedented level of fellow feeling. Uh, and what's important is that it went on uh, for years and decades after that. So I think we can emerge from this with a society in which we are valuing cooperation a lot more strongly uh, relative to competition. Um, I also hope that our government will be giving a much higher priority uh, to our personal well-being uh, in the years to come. So let's just look at a few facts. In Europe and the USA, more people have already died from this epidemic than in the whole of East Asia, non-communist uh, as well as communist, even though that is an area with double population and where the virus started. So what's been going on in the West? Basically, we have given priority to sustaining the GDP over the well-being of the people. And that's got to change. Uh, as uh, Thomas Jefferson said, the life and happiness of the people are actually the first and only responsibilities of the government. Uh, so let's hope that governments too, as well as our culture, will emerge with a far greater focus on people's well-being. Finally, ourselves. It will obviously require a, a lot of wisdom for all of us to come through this period of huge anxiety for everybody. But of course, some people will suffer a lot more. People who lose their loved ones, uh, people who lose their jobs and don't have governments wise enough uh, to sustain their livelihoods. Uh, we've all got to find inner resources to draw on. Um, I personally am going to be drawing on, on the 10 keys to happier living uh, that are put out by the organization called Action for Happiness, actionforhappiness.org. Uh, and these spell out uh, the letters for great dream. So, so great is the five, as it were, fruit and veg we have to do every day uh, to keep our spirits up. Giving, relating, even if remotely, uh, exercising, appreciating what we've got, and trying out new things. These are things uh, that we shall do every day. And we should also think about the longer term things in the dream, which is like direction. It may be a time to reappraise uh, what really matters to us in life. So this is a very, very hard time, but I do believe it can have a silver lining. I think we can end up uh, with a society which has more fellow feeling, uh, more concern for the common good, uh, and in which people are better focused on the things that 
really matter to them. So let's hope uh, uh, that that works out well and very good luck to all of you. Well, we hope you enjoyed watching this programme about happy people, places, planet. We'd like to thank all the people who helped us make this programme and in particular our contributors from all over the world. Yes, and over the coming weeks you'll find other examples that we're developing to promote happiness and well-being on our YouTube channel. Our aim is to create a global video stream to help people discover happiness and how they can improve their mental health and well-being at this particular time with the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, and we'll be introducing more practical ways to increase happiness and well-being in our everyday lives at home, in the community and the workplace during the global coronavirus pandemic. Please tell all your family and friends and work associates about the World Happiness Project. Invite them to visit our YouTube channel and visit our website at worldhappinessproject.com. Yes, indeed. Do subscribe to the YouTube channel to keep up to date with what we're doing. And thank you for watching. Thank you for watching. Now, as a little fun PS, we've got a snippet here from Sir Anthony Selden's version of the song Happy. We hope it'll bring a smile to your face. We know you're going to like it. Bye for now. May seem crazy what I'm about to say. Sunshine, she's here. You can take a break. I'm a hot air balloon that could go to space. With the air, like I don't care, baby, by the way. Come on. Along if you feel like a room without a roof Clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth